Gerard, we're standing in front of Prunella Clough's lorry driver, well, lorry and ladder one of 1952. And uh, let's talk about it in some sort of context. So 1952, it's now seven years after the war. Um, she has been back in London from uh, Lowestoft, where she painted a lot of fishermen. And, uh, and here it is, a very, very utilitarian painting, an oil on canvas. Yeah. During the war, Prunella spent a lot of her time, as she put it, grafting away, working. She was a map mapper for the civil service, was part of her war effort. Uh, and also she was a designer. So she understood the world of work and she was always interested in labor and work. And this was painted at a time when Britain was being rebuilt. There was a lot of redevelopment, regeneration going on. So this is a painting concerned with work, concerned with labor and the reconstruction of Britain. Uh, she doesn't consider the driver as a character or a personality, bottom right hand corner. He's much more angular, treated in an angular fashion, an almost semi-abstract manner, like the objects of his labour, like the accoutrements, the ladders and the bits of scaffolding, the rope uh, in the back of the lorry. Uh, so in a sense, workmen and, uh, and lorry are united and, and painted in, in a similar style. The, the colours are very muted. That's right. So was, was there a, a lack of um, paint in 1952 or...? or... I, don't think that's the, I don't think that would have uh, been the point. Mm. Brunella is a colourist. Yeah. We know this from her later yeah. works and everything else. She knows the value of colour. Mm. But I think here the colour is muted. It's utilitarian, as we were saying. Uh, it's the colour of metal and wood and rope and mud. The building side, these are the colours she saw on the building side. It, it's Britain in 1952. Yeah. It's, it's muted and it's grey. And it's dull. <laughs> <laughs> now, you just mentioned about her later work, and I'm looking at the lower left-hand corner yeah. of this work, which is a very, very abstract um, part of the painting where her signature is in the lower left. Yes. Uh, it seems to be... You can see all the seeds of what she gets up to later mm -hmm. on, this formalised laying out of, of the objects. And with a kind of... Uh, a clarity of purpose. Re we've got to remember she was a designer, yep. Prunella. So everything is placed absolutely, ob you know, um, some of the forms going right off to the edges of the picture, almost like guy ropes, holding mm. the, the, the composition in mm. place here. Uh, and the imagery hovers between abstraction and figuration. And this, this is the area where, where Prunella excelled. It's almost as though uh, she, she sees an abstract shape in something formal mm. and something uh, um, naturalistic. And at the same time, in something naturalistic, she sees something you know, it's a, of it's abstraction. A, it's a little bit like Victor Passmore of the late 40s yeah. when, when the, um, the paintings point. of the Thames go into more more abstraction. Yes, yes don't you that's think? right. So it's a sign of things to come, looking at the painting. So, Gerard, we're now looking at uh, an oil on canvas called Oblique One of 1978. It is 76 by 76 centimetres, which is about um, 29 and a quarter inches square. Yeah. Now, it, this is an old favourite of mine. Good. I've always, I've always loved this painting. So tell me something about this. It's, it's, it's... Well, I think one of the clues to, these, to the paintings of this period is the little snapshots of... Uh, overlooked items or overlooked things that she's encountered in the street, uh, on a building site, somewhere where she's walking up and down and she's, she's, she's noticed, for example, in the bottom, on the, along the bottom edge, there are these... These hooks. Yeah, now the, they're what you call rebars. Those are the bars that come out of concrete, you know, when they... Which they, they strengthen, concrete. yeah. That's right, and they turn the top of yeah. them, they twist the top of them. She's obviously seen these as she's walked past somewhere and it's become a decorative motif. Mm -hmm. I, we're reminded, I think, also of road markings when you think of um, thermoplastic paint, you know, when they yeah. put the road markings yeah. down. And these images, these little fragments of what she sees collide into a composition like this. 
I'm interested in also the, how she paints these images because yeah. when you think of the surface of the road outside and you see the, the, the paint worn away, she does exactly that here. As much as the paint that goes on, she takes off. She takes just as much off. She scraped it off. She's rubbed it off. There's abrasions all over the surface of the picture. And it reveals uh, the picture's own making. It's got a record yeah. at every stage of its making. Underdrawing, underpaint, paint that's been um, uh, removed in order to show the process of... Scraped back. Scraped, Scraped back. Scraped away. Like that. So looking at this composition, the, the left-hand side, one, one, almost one half of it is this off-white colour um, with a lot of scraping back. Yeah. And, and then you see this, this um, kind of configuration. This configuration on the right hand side yeah. with some underpainting. You can see that there is another track yeah. that's going up in you the know, middle there. Very often, when you went to her studio, there would be a painting that she'd be working on and it would be obliterated. Then she would scrape it back and it would turn into another painting. And so they had a long gestation. You know, there was a process of, she called it cooking. Mm -hmm. So they would be left in a corner, folded up until she could find a solution on how to finish a particular pictorial problem, uh, problem that she was working on. But Brunella retains these marks in the finished work. It's a sort of history of the painting. That's right. It's, mm. It retains a record of its own making is mm. the way I like to think of it. And she's also very brave with the composition. I mean, you know, a good third of the picture, there's yeah. nothing happening here. Yeah. Yeah. And she can, Except texture. Yeah. And, and very, Wonderful texture. Very delicate and subtle mm. things too. Um, Venetian red mm. is a particular favourite colour of hers. And as you can see, it's, it, it's, a, a, it's put on and it's removed and in lots of different areas at mm. the same time. Uh, and again, the composition is very formal and geometric. Nothing is left to chance. While she was working on these paintings, she put pieces of card onto the surface and hold them on with bulldog clips mm -hmm. and bits of blue tack yeah. and try them out in different places until she was satisfied she'd arrived at a, uh, you know... A, at a complete composition. Yeah. So here we are, and um, this is a painting called Trellis of 1991. It's an oil on canvas. It's 43 by 43 centimeters, which uh, is 17 by 17 inches. And uh, she moved from Moor Park Road in Fulham to Sherbrooke Road in Fulham in 1983, which was very, very close to North End Road, which uh, she enjoyed immensely. Um, could you well, the, tell us a little bit about her strolls down North End Road? There was a market on North End Road, and she, had, I walked it with her on several occasions, and there were little corner shops and market stalls, and outside, piled up high, there might be plastic chairs or... Um, cheap goods, uh, dishwashing bowls, clothes horses, that kind of thing, but, or hardware, there was a hardware shop where uh, bits of trellis, as mm -hmm. you can see here, would mm -hmm. be sold, or perforated um, sheet metal, chicken wire kind of thing. And she used these, she would buy these to um, help her create these geometrical frameworks and grids and structures as backgrounds to her paintings. They were almost like templates, and she dab the paint through the, the apertures and so on. You can see that, can't you? It forms the yeah, background. Yeah. Now, I can also see the use of blue. Uh, and um, in 1986, she had her cataracts removed. Yeah. And it was rather interesting what she, what she said about her discovery of blue. Yeah, when, when she had the bandages taken off, she was telling us that John Ball and Gordon Hargreaves one night, um, she hadn't been perceiving blue for a number of years, but she was unaware of that. Mm. So when the bandages were removed, all of a sudden, everything had a blue cast to it. And so these blue, these pronounced blues start to appear. And the, there is a, a greater degree of um, lip smacking, high key colouring comes in, in, into the paintings. Um, she used to stare at the gas jets on her, on her cooker, cooker yeah, yeah. To, because of this blue, yeah. this kind of thing. Um, incidentally, the, the, the configuration in the centre there, which 
on the one hand, it could be a flower. It looks or, like one of those um, things that kids have, like a little windmill. Oh, like a windmill mm. or even a washing up mop. Yeah, yeah. But all these ambiguities, mm. you know, mm. just like the market itself, yeah. so up and down. North and she just right? plays around with the shape and arrives at... Yeah. And also, it's very painterly, you know. This is a catalogue of what yeah. you can do with pigment. Yeah. Yeah. They're a bit scraped on, dabbed on, deposits sitting on the surface. And wonderful pink that she's used yeah. on the right-hand side. And do you see how these little elements, these little lozenges have detached themselves mm. and seem to float throughout the composition? Endlessly inventive with, with her use of paint, I think, and pigment. And of course, she was working mark against mark, experimenting, seeing if it would fit, she didn't know what it would look like mm. before she started the painting. Yeah. She had a kind of vague idea what she was after and she moved towards it in an experimental way, I think. 